rolling. Awesome. Dr. Daryl Ray, thank you so much for being here. For, for those who don't know Dr. Ray and his work, you started recovering from religion. That so that's we're going on what uh, twelve years almost now. Yeah, almost say. twelve years. Yeah, sure um, right. and uh, and the secular therapy project. Yeah, that's um, about almost ten years for it. Would you mind just uh, can we talk about what that is uh, at the outset? Because I think that the work there is so so valuable. Um, so what what's the the purpose of the secular therapy project? Well, uh, it's. The problem was, uh, the problem it addresses is that there are so many poorly trained therapists out there and there's so many therapists that want to bring religion into the therapeutic relationship, which should be, is, is technically unethical, but people do it anyway. So I, in 20, uh, 2011, I was getting a lot of people asking, I need some help. I need help after they read my book, The God Virus. And I tried to help him find a good psychologist. And you might think that as a psychologist, I could probably find good psychologists, but I couldn't. Hmm. You can't get on the internet and find a, a therapist that's clearly secular and clearly uses evidence-based methods. So I decided to create a database uh, of therapists. And we now have 461 therapists registered with our site. And those, and, uh, those ther therapists are all vetted. They have to prove to us that they're secular. They have to prove to us they use evidence-based methods, and they have to establish that they're licensed in whatever jurisdiction or country that they're in, if there is a licensing procedure. So what that allows is for other people um, who, who want to make sure there's no religion brought into their uh, therapy sessions, they can come to us, they can find a therapist, they can do therapy and know that nobody's going to ask you to pray. We've had therapists, we've had stories of therapists saying, well, if you come to my church, you'll, you won't be as depressed mm. or had therapists say, well, a big part of your mental illness is because you're an atheist. You need to find a God of some kind mm. or something. You know, that's just bullshit. And people should not be re-traumatized by their therapist. If sure. they're going to the therapist, especially for something like religious trauma, they don't want to hear more Jesus from, from their, their therapist. Right. So anyway, yeah. yeah. So that's what the secular therapy project does. Go to secretarytherapy.org and, uh, you can, I'm going to, you can uh, register. It's very simple and you can search for somebody near you. And of course in COVID these days, a lot of therapists are doing telehealth. So they're, they would talk to people just like you and I are talking. Right. That's what and my therapist could, has been doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's great. So, and, uh, and it's, it, I, I had experience with the exact phenomena you're describing that, that many people have had of, of being in a, what should be a therapeutic environment and then having a therapist with all the best intentions in the world begin proselytizing. Um, and oh. uh, so I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I appreciate the work that you're doing. That um, should be grounds for losing your damn license. That really should, but you know, religion dominates this culture and unfortunately right. that it's not, un it's unethical, but not uncommon. Well, there's so, one yeah. particular element of, of the, the religious uh, influence on our culture, on our society that I wanted to zero in on today with you. And <laughs> I, I, I want to give a little background to the viewers. So, uh, so Dr. Ray came out with a book a number of years ago um, that's called Sex and God, and it explores this relationship between how how religion sort of uh, you know primes people psychologically to to interact with themselves with their sexual desires and impulses and kinks in in irrational ways and in in destructive ways. And uh, in in 2012, I, I went to go see a lecture. Uh, given by Dr. Ray uh, in in Southern California, and um, I went with a young lady I was going to college with at the time, uh, thinking that a lecture called "Sex and God" would be you know a real a real turn on. Um, and at the outset, uh, well, <laughs> maybe you can describe sort of the, the the structure of this, how you talk about anatomy before getting into uh, <laughs> more specifics about human beings. There's a, so the, the lecture begins with, with, there was a series of slides uh, related to duck genitalia and <laughs> duck sexual practices, um, uh, duck rape. And this is all stuff that um, it, actually in the presentation, it's actually quite fascinating, <laughs> but I, I, I was telling Dr. Ray before we started recording, I don't know if I've ever seen an audience pull back more quickly uh, in a lecture I've ever seen, but then we're, we're eventually drawn back in. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it's quite a good presentation, um, but but that's why <laughs> that experience and reading your your book uh, Sex and God was why I wanted to reach out to you to talk about this how um, how how religious uh, 
conditioning, indoctrination, whatever you would like to call it, um, has a detrimental effect on people and their and their relationship to themselves as sexual beings and others. Right, right. So I would begin this discussion on the positive on this positive note, and probably end it on this positive note. Uh, anyone listening or watching this podcast right now should first of all recognize that this is the only life you've got. It's the only body you're going to get. And if, no matter what, you've got to be happy with what you've got. I mean, there's no alternative here. So I want people to be happy, to explore their bodies, to gain pleasure from their bodies, to look upon their bodies as what it is, you know, the thing that, that you um, are, are closest to. And you are the first person you're going to have sex with. And you may be the last person you're going to have sex with. So let's get used to it. And let's get an attitude that says my body is for my pleasure. From I can do what I want with my body. Nobody else can tell me that. So with that said, what does religious tell us? Religions tells us that we're our bodies are our enemies and that you can't trust your body and that you must uh, kill the flesh. I mean, the Christian religion is full of that kind of stuff. And that women are second class citizens and that women's bodies are a temptation to men and men can't control themselves. I mean, think of there are hundreds and hundreds of these kinds of messages being given by religions all the time. And we we're being programmed, even if you were never raised religious, you're still in this in, in this culture, in this environment that shames boys, for example, for masturbating, tells people that they shouldn't look at pornography, even though that's pretty a universal thing uh, tells people that masturbation will ruin your relationship. And there's so much going on there. Mm. And I want to debunk it all. I want to give people an opportunity to live this one life with the pleasure you can get from your body. That's, that's my attitude. Anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. When you talk about control, um, not just, <clears throat> I mean, of oneself, but even, um, you know, projecting control onto other people is something that I see, um, especially, uh, so my background was in sort of evangelical Christianity, um, the idea of men needing to control women. Um, yes, right. Uh, was built in there. Um, in a lot of your work, you talk about um, jealousy, but on a deeper level, talking about shame being a mm -hmm. byproduct of, of, of the religious experience. Can we can we touch on that for a little bit? Sure, sure. I, I, I think we need to look, those are two different things. Then we can spend a lot of time on either one. They're they're kind of big, big issues. So let's start with shame. First of all, I think we need to discriminate between what is shame and what is guilt. There, there are two different components that you could see them on a on a, a continuum in some ways, with with guilt over here and shame over here, if you will. But guilt, um, sh shame for is is communal. Shame has to deal with your identity. You know. So if you feel shame, it's probably because, well, for example, I would, I would, I would feel so ashamed if my mother found out I masturbated. I would just feel so ashamed. Well, where did you get that notion of shame, and why does it involve your mother? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, so it, however, on the other side, if you feel something like guilt, guilt is more uh, situationally based. And can be easily corrected, whereas shame goes to your very core of your being. So it's, it's really important to know the difference. And some religions, as I as you know, I write about in, in my book, some religions are more shame-based and other religions are more guilt-based. All religions use both. Don't get me wrong. Christianity, Islam, all of them use this both. But Islam, for example, is much more shame-based. And for example, if a, if a woman uh, has sex outside of a marriage in Iran, she's very likely to get herself stoned or, mm. or killed or certainly kicked out of the home or sold into a select sex slavery. I mean, there's all sorts of things can happen because it, it's a shame and shame is like a, um, is like a, a disease. Yeah. It's perceived as a disease. We cannot allow a shameful person to be, remain a part of our community. It's very hard, if not impossible to gain forgiveness for a shame-based uh, violation. And that's why you go ahead and kill the person or chop their head off, you know, or torture them or whatever you do. But you've got to get them out of the community because they're a, an infection on the religious uh, cultural environment. It's an interesting that, point yeah, about the violation being against, not just against them, but against their, their families, their fathers, their community. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh, they, they don't have ownership of their own sexual identities in that in that context, really. Right, uh, right. All. And so the father, I mean, you get these things uh, we hear about it all the time, honor killings in the, in the Muslim world. Well, don't get me wrong. There were honor killings in the Christian world, too, and still may be. They're just hidden very well or, you know, they're they're in, in places or people that we we don't hear about. They're not I'm not saying they're as common in Christianity, but 500 years ago they were. A girl have sex out of sight of marriage and not marry the right guy. She could she could be fi find herself dead. Five hundred years ago, we are Christianity is not that much farther, so called farther ahead of Islam. So don't don't get that idea. Now on the other side, guilt, however, is guilt is different. It's more interesting in some ways because guilt is the internal thought police that your family teaches you to be. I should feel guilty if you do this. If if I steal something, I should feel guilty. Nobody may ever know about it, but I would still have a guilt feeling inside. Shame is shame involves the community. Guilt is just a, a individual emotion, if you will. Right. So I'm I would feel I would feel guilt in myself, and I could go for having masturbated this morning. So I would go and pray to the priest. I would I would ask forgiveness. I would pray. I would read the Bible. I'd go to Sunday school. Something like that to get over my guilt. And I may, I may never tell anybody about it. Nobody ever find out about it. So that that's more guilt. Guilt is the, is the mental policeman you carry around in your head all the time. You could actually do a shameful act, but not feel guilty about it. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. That's an interesting distinction that I, that I, yeah, I hadn't really, really explored. Um, I wonder, as, you know, as, as skeptics and, and advocates, you know, I wonder which which uh, target is is maybe more accessible. W w I mean, because with guilt being such an individualized thing, I wonder if um, you know, sort of focusing attention on on shifting cultural pressure away from you know more traditional religious uh, norms, um, if 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 undermining shame can lead to the 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 undermining of the guilt or vice versa. I, well, I mean, shame requires a community. So if you get rid of the community or if you, you disempower the community, for example, Mormonism, Mormonism is much more shame based than than, say, Baptists are. Now, again, I want to remind we they they both use both right. <laughs> Baptists and Mormons both use shame and guilt. But the Mormons Mormon have better pamphlets, though. The Mormons yeah. have better literature. Oh, God. <laughs> they have horrible literature. I, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, I don't know. People may not be aware. They're, I don't know if they still do this. There used to be a, a pamphlet they'd give out yes. about, like, don't tamper with your equipment or something. The, I, the factory. The, don't tamper the with factory. the factory. Yep. Yeah. It, I, I, wrote, I wrote about that in uh, The God Virus. Yeah. Right. It was, um, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be, you know, these these pamphlets given to young boys to, to tell them that touching themselves is uh is a you know a negative act is something that is gonna you know make God unhappy with them. The interesting thing is that uh, they only used to give them to boys, but recently they right. now got a new one. They're given to girls. They finally discovered that girls masturbate too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. When you a, a minute ago when you said the thing about you know being a, being a, a ashamed or embarrassed if your mother finds out that you masturbate, the first thought in the back of my head was like you know she's she's doing it too. You know, and, and she probably already knows that you're doing it. I mean, it's this is a, a universal thing that we all act like it doesn't happen. Yeah, um, yeah. I was fortunately raised in a I, well. My family was fundamentalist. My, my mother was pretty open minded in many ways. And one morning, uh, she came into my bedroom unannounced while I was masturbating, and caught me. Of course, I I just had a horrible, shameful feeling about it. And she sat down in the corner of my bed and patted me on the shoulder and said, that's all right, Daryl. It's uh, You won't do it when you get married. <laughs> she was half right. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, though, that's I, I, there's much worse responses out there from parents. Um, I agree. So, <laughs> mom sounds like a nice lady. Um, she was. So with uh, Okay, so... So that that's the guilt and shame piece. Is that suffice? Does that satisfy you or give you an answer you're looking for? I think so. I I'm wondering in your in your research and, and all the, the work that you've done on this, when you're you're seeing how different religions uh, relate to human beings as sexual uh, you know beings, um, are there religions that are getting it more right? Is there anything that stands out to you globally where um, any religions are are you know more? I guess open minded on this on this sex, front. Sex sex positive. I here's here's yeah. my um 
here's my assessment of religions uh, generally. If it's a patriarchal religion, it is by, almost by definition a sex negative religion, period. Right. So that counts out, and let me let me enumerate them. That counts out Christianity. It counts Islam. It counts Hinduism for sure, and it counts Buddhism for sure. Don't let anybody tell you that Buddhism is any more sex positive than any other religion. It may be in California, but it sure isn't in Thailand or Cambodia. I'll tell okay. you that. Women still are second-class citizens within Buddhism. The Dalai Lama himself uh, condemns uh, homosexuality and condemns masturbation. That's the Dalai Lama, you know, the highest of uh, Theravada Buddhism, I think. Anyway, so all those are patriarchal religion, and Buddhism is definitely a patriarchal religion. On the non-patriarchal side, you can look at tribal kinds of religions, uh, pagan type of religions, Wicca, almost, not all of them, but many, many of those are much more sex positive. I'm not saying they're sex positive in every aspect, because there are some pretty sex negative practices among, you know, some uh, tribal kinds of religions. In fact, there's some horrendous practices among those. But you get a wider spectrum. At least you have some hope of sex positivity. And there are some religions, for example, the Manganian, uh, Manganian religion from the southern uh, South Pacific. It's a small island in the South Pacific. It's one of the most isolated human inhabited islands on the planet. Very sex positive. I mean, it's so sex positive that women, it, it just, women are women control the sexual relationship. And the ant teaches the boys and the girls about sex. And the ant teaches the boys that you must you must give a girl three orgasms before you have an orgasm yourself. Marriage is not even a big thing in that particular environment. And then, of course, you've got a Hawaiian culture pre-contact before Captain Cook arrived and the Presbyterians arrived and killed them all with smallpox, of course. But before that happened, you could get your head cut off on the Hawaiian islands for eating the wrong food. Think about that. Eating the wrong food gets your head cut off. But who you fuck, nobody cared. Unless you were the king. If you're the king or the prince, uh, princess or the queen, there were there were rules about who you could have sex with. But but nobody else cared. And marriage, marriage wasn't even, I mean, they didn't have marriage in many ways. Or if it was, it was a very loose form of marriage. So Yes. I mean, the answer to the question is there are some religions, the pagans. I, I love the pagans. I love the Wiccas. They're very sex positive in many ways. Probably the most sex positive. Uh, the Satanists. I love the Satanists. <laughs> They're pretty damn sex positive, too. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I was wondering if there was just any, any culture in the world that was, you know, where, uh, you know, the humans were acting more like the more like the bonobos, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, well, yes. Was, yes yeah. and no. The, the Muoso culture uh, in China the 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 woman can totally controls the sexual relationships and when she gets to be 13 years of age she is given her own e outdoor exit or door to the compound and when uh, when a man uh, when she wants to have sex with a man she invites him in and anybody any woman can have sex with any man they don't even have a word for father they don't have a word for husband or wife there's no such thing as marriage in this culture and it's been going like this for we think thousands of years and do we know for a fact that it was going in around the 1200s because that's when Marco Polo visited this particular tribe on his way to China. And he writes about it. We actually have written records from the 1200s from Marco Polo about the Moso culture. So that's pretty, that's pretty amazing that this culture has this practice. And they, if, if you ask one of a Moso woman, who's the father of this child, she'd laugh at you. I mean, they don't even have a word for father in the, they don't care. the The father figures are the uncles, the uncles of of the uh, woman, and the, there is a big rule, a very important rule, that if the man comes and visits a woman, you know, at her invitation, of course, then he has to be out before breakfast. You don't you don't stay there. You don't get married. You don't sleep together every night. It's you may have to walk twenty miles to have uh, you to have sex, but you better be out by breakfast. <laughs> See, and this is, I, this is, I wish more people were more aware of just how much cultural diversity there is in this planet of ours, that the way that we do things isn't the way. Right, and right. It, we're all, I mean, as human beings, we're all making this shit up as we go. <laughs> and, and in light yeah. of this, 
I, I'd love to ask you. So from a skeptical perspective, for, for a person who wants to take a skeptical approach to have, have, have good, you know, reasons for engaging in, in different sexual behaviors or, or, or embracing certain attitudes towards sex, what are some questions that you think people should be asking themselves to figure out who they are and what they want to be doing uh, sexually? Wow, that's a big question. Uh, I don't have time to do therapy here with all, right. with all of your <laughs> viewers. <but. laughs> I mean, when, when, when I'm talking to people just strictly about epistemology, the question that I ask guests is, if you could give everybody in the world one epistemological tool uh, uh -huh. to help them, you know, get, get closer to truth and, and let go of dogmas and things, what would you give them if you could just wave a magic wand? Yeah, so, well, let me, let me go back to... Let me just talk briefly about why I wrote Sex and God, and then I'll yeah. be I'll be able to answer your question more directly. I wrote Sex and God because I realized I wanted to show people that there's far more ways of being sexual than being Chris than a Christian sexuality or Muslim sexuality or Mormon sexuality, and I do call them that. I call them Catholic sexuality and Baptist sexuality. Each one of them have a sexuality, but and here's the most important epistemological um, thing to say is that. None of them are based in evidence. None of them are based in science. So what I wanted to do was say, let's look at the science of sex. And that's why I talk about duck sex. Right. That's why I talk about bonobo sex and gorilla sex. I want to show people there's a wide range of sexualities in the natural world. Oh, and then let's look at humans. And in, within humans, you can see there's the Mooso, there's the Na culture, the Maganian culture. We have all these cultures. There's there are 27 or 28 cultures in South America alone, and there probably were other places. You know, before, before there was Western contact or Muslim contact, all these different sexualities existed. But when Christianity comes and kills three quarters of your population with smallpox and then forces the rest of them to become Christian, that, mm. that former sexuality is lost and it's lost forever to that area. But there are 20 or 7, 28 uh, cultures in South America alone that, that practice something called partible paternity. Have you ever heard of that term, partible paternity? Hey, refresh my memory. Huh. Well, it, sounds, it rings a bell, but yeah, it's it's simply the notion that it takes more than one man to make a healthy baby. So a woman realizes if if I only have, well, if you're a primitive scientist in the Amazon and you notice a pecari female mates with multiple males, or if you see your dog, your female dog meeting mating with multiple male dogs and then they have a litter of very healthy babies you might conclude as a primitive scientist that it takes several men's sperm to create a healthy baby so in those cultures the women will want to mate with two or three other men and from that mating will come a baby and it'll be healthy and oh by the way now we have three men who are who think they're the father <laughs> mm. And you have opportunities and will have opportunities to support this, this child. So it actually brings the whole village in, into the process, if, if you will. So uh, I, why was I going there? I had a reason for going there. <laughs> I'm an epistemological basis. Oh, for, right, right, right. You know, yeah. So once you realize that the, the way to be skeptical and ask questions around this is saying, is what I've been taught scientifically valid or is it a cultural construct? This notion, for example, let's take a cultural construct that seemed to be unchallenged until fairly recently, and that's circumcision. Hmm. Almost nobody in our culture believes that female circumcision is right, and yet male circumcision is not even questioned. It's a cultural construct. There is no fucking scientific reason to circumcise boys, just like there's no fucking scientific reason to circumcise girls, period. Your body is what it is, and it's it's made that way for an evolutionarily uh, for an evolutionary reason, probably. So that's a cultural construct that I find atheists aren't even aware of, and they just go to the hospital, have their boys circumcised, and never think about it. Right. And I'm challenging that. I'm challenging it actively as a circumcised male. I wish I had those thirty eight thousand nerve endings that that got cut <laughs> off. You know, so yeah. <laughs> I mean. And, and I am not here to equate female circumcision with male circumcision. I'm not. That's I'm. There's, they are not equivalent by a long shot. Right. But why are we doing either? That's what I want to ask. Let's stop it all over the planet. Because it yeah. has emotional and psychological 
and physical consequences, of course. Well, and, that, so, and the, the point about not even being aware that, that, that there are questions <laughs> that should be asked, how many things we yeah. just go along with in our day-to-day -day lives, thinking yeah. well, just because it's how it's, you know, in our mind, how it's always been done. Um, you know, well, the, yeah, and we, we've got other other things you can ask is the whole notion of, um, of sex addiction. I don't know if you've seen my talk on the myth of sex addiction. I have not. Well, I find a lot of atheists believe there's such a thing as sex addiction when there is no evidence for sex addiction. And what about all so, these rock stars going to rehab? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's a get out. The, the sex addiction has become a get out of jail free card for politicians and right, the rock right. stars. Hey, honey, you caught me with the the escort. I, yeah, it, right. And I need to. All right. So, well, OK, so what's 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 your position on this? It, it, there's no scientific evidence. There's been a couple different committees of the American Psychological and Psychiatric Association study this for 20 years. Nobody can come up with a definition that's verifiable. Hmm. There's no de there's no diagnostic criteria in the DSM-5. So if you don't have a diagnostic criteria within the DSM-5, you probably aren't going to be able to diagnose it. And the DSM, how, how do yeah. they? Then? How, how do how do <laughs> it, with no with no diagnostic criteria? What are what are you know, therapists and the people who run these facilities to, to treat sex addiction, what are they going off of here? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, we did some research on that and uh, I've, I've found some rather shady practices. People will, you know, the guy, uh, what about that celebrity that, you know, he, he gets caught with his pants down with somebody he shouldn't have been supposedly. And he says, well, I'm a sex addict. I'm going to go to therapy. Well, when he gets there, if, if they want to file an insurance claim, you can't file an insurance claim on a, on a diagnosis that doesn't exist. So what they have to do is they have to make up a diagnosis. So we'll say, well, you know, Kenneth isn't a sex, uh, we're going to say Kenneth's a sex addict, but for the insurance purposes, we're going to say he's depressed mm -hmm. and we'll fire the insurance claim as a uh, treatment for depression since we can't file it for sex addiction. And uh, uh, an investigation by some insurance uh, and insurance company found out this was happening. Primarily, the, the huge numbers of, of depression claims were coming out of Utah. And when they, of course, Mormons, <laughs> and when they investigated, they, they found out that it was, it was these ranches that they were sending kids to for to get, okay, you're a 15-year-old kid, you get caught masturbating or you get caught using porn masturbating to porn, let's be honest about it. And and they their parents say, well, you must be a sex addict. We're going to send you off to one of these ranches. Oh, geez. Well, what are you going to, what are you going to do? A 15 year old kid's going to be jacking off three or four, 10 times a day. Sometimes <laughs> that's just normal. <laughs> and it's the same thing for a girl. But if you, so you send them off, you can't say, well, they're sex addict to the insurance company. So you tell them they're, they're depressed. Mm. That's what's going on there. You, please go look, uh, you can just look it up. Uh, Oklahoma Free Thought about 2014 or 15. I gave okay. a, a very, it's one of the most popular talks I've ever done on why there is no such thing as sex addiction. And if you don't believe me, I, I'm I'm somewhat of an expert. Go look at Dr. David Lay's book, The Myth of Sex Addiction. It's a whole book on the subject. Or go read Dr. Marty Klein's essay that he published in the American Humanist Magazine titled, You're Addicted to What? Question mark. So there's <laughs> There's no evidence, and yet we've got great evidence. I'm not saying sex can't be a problem. Don't get me mm. wrong. But you, what we want to do is in psychological, we want to look at the underlying issues. Now, probably somebody may, let, let me just say in my clinical experience, when people get divorced, their masturbation goes way up. I mean, they've lost their only sex partner, perhaps. They're lonely as hell. What are they going to do? They're going to self-medicate. Well, they could drink themselves into a stupor. They could go get a lot of pot or they could jack off or they could do all three. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> uh, is that sex addiction? Is that alcoholism? No, it's loneliness. It's depression. Let's look at what's the underlying cause. Now, you could have obsessive compulsive kind of behavior that, that is acted out in, in um, lots and lots of masturbation. Or, or something like that. But let's look at what the underlying root cause is, and it's an OCD kind of diagnosis. We can diagnose depression. We can diagnose OCD. 
Why do we need to be talking about sex? Because this culture is so damn puritanical. The minute you put any, the minute anything mentions sex, then it becomes, ah, oh, it's terrible. It's sex addiction. Right. right, right. Yeah, so. I remember in that talk that I saw you give uh, all years ago, you had a, a map in the talk where, where it showed uh, like porn search statistics yeah. uh, by state. <laughs> And I was, I don't know why I was so surprised at the states that were, you know, the, you know, the heavy uh, consumers when it came yep. to uh, certain search terms and things. Um, but uh, Utah, you, you mentioned in Utah jogged it in my memory, because if I remember correctly, Utah was number one yes, uh, at that time. One. And Mississippi um, was number two. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how much of our, of our dysfunction in our society comes from this puritanical you know, underlying foundation here where people don't feel like they can just express what they want. So they, they, they have to, you know, keep the, everything else held in until, you know, they, they, well, there's a, there's a profound answer to that in my estimation. That is our puritanical sexuality, sexual nature in North America, in the United States, not Canada, forgive me, Canadians. I didn't mean that in the United States is is directly re re related to re religious pur puritanism and it comes straight out of our, our current political system is dominated by sexual puritanical ideas and it, that's how the religious right has taken over this country because the puritanical issues and ideas around abortion and creating shame to women around their own bodies and about their right to choose whether to have a baby or not. Mm -hmm. that, that is dominating our culture right now. So I can honestly say, and I could say it in many different ways, abortion rules our country right now. And abortion is directly related to religious puritanical notions about who has control over women's bodies. It is yeah. that deep and it's that con. There is no doubt in my mind if the, if, if we weren't a puritanical, puritanical culture with that deep roots going way back to, to the Puritans landing in Plymouth Rock years, hundreds of years ago, we probably wouldn't be having the discussion today and abortion wouldn't be a big deal. You know, until 1975 or 80, abortion wasn't a big deal. Most people don't remember that, but <laughs> my wife and I got an abortion in 1971. Um, no big deal. We just drove up, got it done one day and came back. There was no, you know, it wasn't a big problem, but now, think, yeah, I don't think people realize no, just how big of an impact, fo you know, folks like Jerry Falwell and, you know, Phyllis Schlafly and, and, and you know, there, 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 there was uh, what you're describing again, we're, we're, we're uh, touching on this, this idea that there's things that in, in 2020 America, we regard as normal that even in recent history in the seventies and sixties, we're, we're not normal. <laughs> Um, they, they were not normal. You're right. People um, have yeah. short memories, the short memories or no memory. I mean, if you were yeah. born later, you wouldn't remember this, but I'm here to remind everyone that what we're experiencing here today is, is really abnormal. Even in American culture, we are more puritanical. We have more control over religious control over our environment than probably at almost any time in our history. I am a I'm a history nut. I read history all the time. I've read hundreds of books around American history. I don't see any play. I'm not saying we didn't have a lot of religious uh, involvement in, in years and centuries past, but it's never been this pervasive. Yeah. And it starts yeah. with things like, like uh, the purity movement, purity culture, and the uh, abstinence only being taught in schools with government funds by religious organizations. I mean, the purity culture has pervaded our, our society now for 20 years. Women are being taught you can't have sex. And if you do, you're horrible. You're a slut. You shouldn't masturbate. All these things are being taught to girls that are 12, 13, 14 years old. Yeah. That's just that's just abusive. And yet our tax dollars paid for that. When I was a kid, uh, the hot book that was being passed around in, in evangelical circles was, uh, was called I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Yeah, and the asshole that wrote that is now divorced and back out dating, and uh, he, <laughs> right. and he's he's so he's apologized, but he he hurt a lot of people. I people don't know if committed, you know about that. <laughs> yeah, people committed suicide over 
their inability to live up to his stupid standard. I, yeah, I, I, well, and I can't tell you in the in the community that I grew up in. I mean, we, there was there were high rates of teen pregnancy. You had you had high I mean, <laughs> across the board when there's when there's you know abstinence only, you know, sex education, sex miseducation, frankly. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, for for people who might not know about this, for you know, so the, 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 this purity movement. Um, in, what I grew up in, um, just to give you a, a taste, in this book, one of the practices that was condemned was was holding hands. And this idea was that if you were to hold hands, if you were a, a young man and you were to hold hands with a young lady, that what you were communicating to the world was ownership over her. And that's not your place to do until you're her husband. And yeah, because her dad owns her up to that her point. Her dad owns her now, <laughs> and then when you, and then when she, when she's your wife, then she, the transition of of property happens. Um, and I, uh, I mean, it's no wonder that in in communities where this type of mindset is is you know embraced. And frankly, this is, I mean, it's 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 not a a, a far jump from from reading the Bible to these types of conclusions. Um, it's no surprise that sexual dysfunction is uh, is is everywhere. Right, right. Um, and, yeah, and I would like to address the dis sexual dysfunction because I see a lot of atheists, a lot of secularists, humanists, people that are long since left religion still have problems with sex. I mean, I got a blog. I somebody sent me a blog the, entry. The Christian atheists, right? I, I've heard you use this term. Yeah, before. yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. The Christian atheists. Yeah, you might be a Christian atheist if you still feel guilty about masturbating. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel guilty because you had an abortion. I mean, those are the kinds of things that I, I try to tell people. As you well know, in my talks, I think the very first thing I did in that particular talk, because I do it in almost all of my sex talks, first thing I do is I say, I masturbate. How many of you masturbate? Right. And you see like I, three or four timid hands come up. <laughs> Everyone else is looking around. <laughs> yeah, why are why are atheists having trouble having trouble admitting what they everybody knows? You know, yeah. I was yeah. trained by the great psychotherapist Albert Ellis, the founder of cognitive behavioral therapy. That was he was my mentor, and he had a famous saying. He says ninety seven percent of men will admit to masturbating, and the other three percent are lying. Right now, uh, right. you know, you right. could you could argue with the statistics, but he's pretty much right there. Right. So why are we afraid to to talk openly about our sexuality? And to the degree that you're still feeling shame or guilt, you still harbor religious ideation inside of your brain. Yeah. And the way out of this, it seems to be like you mentioned earlier, just just look for, you know, evidence based. <laughs> look, right. for, look at what look at what the science says. Don't I mean, I mean, there's 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 so much research out there. Um, in terms of human sexuality, which, and, th and this is a key point that you, you mentioned, you know, Christian sexuality and Islamic sexuality and, 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 and that all these different religious sects have their own sort of brand of sexuality, but these stand in contrast to human sexuality. Yes. It, right. So right. there's um, nothing scientific about <clears throat> Christian sexuality or Muslim sexuality. Nothing at all. One of my heroes just died a couple of weeks ago, Betty Dodson. And while she wasn't really involved in the religious side of it, I think she kind of ignored it. And she just opened herself up to teaching mainly women about their sexuality. And she became famous back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. She just died at like, I think she was 89 years old when she died a couple of weeks ago. But her thing was bringing women into a room, everybody, all the women getting naked and masturbating, learning how to give yourself an orgasm. Now, I learned from Betty. She was kind of a long distance mentor. I never met her, but she, I, I think she's like a sex god to many, many people and, and a mentor to me. And what I learned from Betty is get familiar with your own body. And one of the things I've been teaching people for years is if you have trouble with your own sexuality, there's one thing you can start with. Do you mind if I do a little therapy here, Kenneth? Not at all. Not <laughs> <Okay>. at all. <laughs> I think we can all use it. Okay, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get naked privately somewhere where you, and I'm talking to men and women, and I want you to get your lube out or whatever and start fantasizing or even looking at some porn. I don't care. And, and then listen to what your brain tells you. As you're masturbating, as you're playing with your clit or whatever, listen to your brain saying, giving you these shame messages. 
I shouldn't do this. This is dirty. I hope nobody finds out, you know, all these, all these things are going to pass through your mind, but I want you to listen to them because those are the things that you need to uh, listen to and then let them just pass on by. This is like a mindfulness exercise here. It's exactly mindful masturbation. Mindful masturbation. You're exactly right. I, I would have used those terms earlier if you'd want to be, but yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. Mindful masturbation. Now I'm not, what what you hope to gain from this, if and you have to do this more than once, dozens of times, but just learn to feel your body, enjoy yourself, listen to those messages and let them move right on by. Mm. Because what you're going to do is you're going to create a much more healthy relationship with yourself. And remember, you're the first sex partner you will ever have, and you may be the last one. So I want you to be very comfortable with you. And then you can be comfortable with somebody else. Many, I have men and women, but mainly men, women come to me saying, I, I, I can't masturbate with my husband, I, you know, whatever, or my sex partner. And one of the first questions I ask is, well, I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't have an orgasm with my husband or a partner. Sorry about that. And our first question I'll ask is, well, can you give yourself an orgasm? Hmm. And you would be shocked at how many women say, no, I can't because I can't masturbate. I'm afraid of that. I was told no, it was heard, terrible. I've heard this. I've seen some of these statistics and, and, yeah. and yeah, it's, uh. I mean, what you said a moment ago, you know, this idea of, I mean, if, if you're, if you're not in touch with your own body, it's going to be really impossible for you to yeah. have, allow someone else to be in touch with it. Right. Um, so if you're, if you can't have an orgasm, how are you going to teach your, your partner to, to help you have an orgasm? Hmm. And that's what Betty Dobson, her, her, rash, her revolutionary approach was let's get women who have never had an orgasm before, get them in a room, get them naked, get them comfortable with herself and teach them how to pay attention to their bodies. And then when they leave, they can they can find sex partners if they want and and enjoy the other partner and enjoy themselves. There's so many people. They've got all this crap going around in their head. They can't just enjoy the moment. Be mindful of what's going on right now. Enjoy that man's penis or that woman's vagina or clit, you know, or her breasts, you know, whatever you're going to be enjoying. Focus on what you're doing, not, not you know not what your mother told you or your priest sure. told you. Sure. Yeah. And, and frankly, you know, I, I hope all of our moms are out there having orgasms too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty uh, sure my, I'm pretty sure my mom, she's been dead for about 15 years. I'm pretty sure she was a pretty horny lady. I could, uh, <laughs> I, I have evidence of that. <laughs> <laughs> not direct evidence by the way <laughs> sure 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 my yeah I, I mean i think it like my, my I, I mean i remember my my father was a pretty sex positive guy but the 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 religious conditioning the what the what was being taught from the church what he was reading in the bible it was this this battle of being like uh, me and my sons we have to get a hold of this because like you said at the very beginning it's like our bodies are our enemies yeah and right. um so for for people out there watching um you know Let's let's make sure that we're we're taking a skeptical approach to these these there's thoughts. A, that pop up. There's a lot of evidence that religion drives uh, inappropriate sexual behavior. I mean, there's a reason why we see so many priests that are abusing, molesting, and raping children. There's a reason why so many Baptist ministers have been caught raping young girls in their own church. Go look at bab stopbaptistpredators.org. It's a whole website devoted just to exposing Baptist ministers. There are thousands of them on there. Or go to the Freedom from Religion Foundation's newsletter. Every year, every month, they have a whole list, black the black collar list of all the clergy who've been caught, you know, a lot of them with sexual crimes. Well, you know, embezzling and other things, of, of course. But there's religion seems to drive, and the, the evidence is pretty clear when you look at the use of pornography. The more religious, as we said earlier, the more religious a state or zip code is, the higher the pornography use is. And you see a, 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 a inverse relationship between religiosity and porn use. Now, we atheists use porn. I use porn. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not going to say it's wrong or bad. But atheists actually use less porn than religious people do. We just don't feel guilty about it. Right. So why are they using more? Because guilt drives behavior. I use the example of smoking, for example, or drinking. Uh, you smoke a cigarette. Dang, I was going to stop smoking. 
Now I feel guilty. I feel so guilty. I need a cigarette to get rid of my guilt. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Or same thing for drinking. So you self-medicate based on the guilt. Well, who taught you the guilt? Oftentimes around sexuality, it was the religion that taught you the guilt. So I feel so guilty about having masturbated and used porn. I go back to use some more master. I masturbate some more and I use porn again. I'm self-medicating based upon the guilt. So I think everybody's going to have their own level of masturbatory behavior, of porn use behavior. Everybody, everybody's different. Yeah. But if you don't have religion involved, you may, let's say you'd settle out at 30%. Whereas if you got religion, you'll you'll practice more at fifty percent, and uh, and then you'll feel guilty about it, and it may drive other mental health issues. If you're prone to OCD, or if you're prone to depression, that may then drive something that your mother-in-law then will call sex addiction. And oh, by the way, it's almost always your mother, your wife, your husband, you know, that's causing you, that's diagnosing. It's never. It should never be a psychologist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, gosh, I, I, yeah. I mean, it just seems to me that that sex should not be something that dominates our lives. It should be something that that we partake of freely, that that we can enjoy freely, um, not feel guilt about. Um, and uh, and I, I appreciate all of the all of the work that you're doing. We're we're running right up on time. Um, where, where can people find you? We're going to put links in the description uh, to Recovering from Religion, Secular Therapy Project, uh, and uh, and I highly recommend people check out Dr. Ray's books. They're they're very good. Um, where where can people find you? Well, they can go to I'm Daryl at Recovering from Religion. If uh, you want to email us, uh, I do encourage anyone needing help to go to the RecoveringFromReligion.org website and hit the chat button and just chat with one of our very well trained agents. Or you can pick up the phone. You can call us directly from Australia, from the United Kingdom, anywhere in North America and South Africa. And, and you can chat with us from anywhere on the planet. We get chats from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, India. We get chats from anywhere in North America. So I, I want people to know that we are here to help you. And we can then connect you with resources you may not be aware of. In fact, I'm pretty darn sure we've got resources you've never heard about. Awesome. So, yeah. And um and do look at my books, Sex and God or The God Virus. I think you'll find them interesting, if not enlightening. Yeah. Stimulating. One more. Stimulating. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I really appreciate you coming on. but And I, and I, I, I want to give you the last word. I want everybody to go out and give themselves a good orgasm today or give somebody else a good orgasm. Awesome. 